treatise two of on friendship and on old age by marcus tullius cicero this librivox recording is in the public domain treatise two on old age part one one and should my service titus ease the weight of care that wrings your heart and draw the sting which rankles there what guerdon shall there be for i may address you atticus in the lines in which flamininus was addressed by the man who poor in health was rich in honour's gold though i am well assured that you are not as flamininus was kept on the rack of care by night and day for i know how well ordered and equable your mind is and am fully aware that it was not a surname alone which you brought home with you from athens but its culture and good sense and yet i have an idea that you are at times stirred to the heart by the same circumstances as myself to console you for these is a more serious matter and must be put off to another time for the present i have resolved to dedicate to you an essay on old age for from the burden of impending or at least advancing age common to us both i would do something to relieve us both though as to yourself i am fully aware that you support and will support it as you do everything else with calmness and philosophy but directly i resolved to write on old age you at once occurred to me as deserving a gift of which both of us might take advantage to myself indeed the composition of this book has been so delightful that it has not only wiped away all the disagreeables of old age but has even made it luxurious and delightful too never therefore can philosophy be praised as highly as it deserves considering that its faithful disciple is able to spend every period of his life with unruffled feelings however on other subjects i have spoken at large and shall often speak again this book which i herewith send you is on old age i have put the whole discourse not as alisto of cos did in the mouth of tithonus for a mere fable would have lacked conviction but in that of marcus cato when he was an old man to give my essay greater weight i represent laelius and scipio at his house expressing surprise at his carrying his years so lightly and cato answering them if he shall seem to show somewhat more learning in this discourse than he generally did in his own books put it down to the greek literature of which it is known that he became an eager student in his old age but what need of more cato's own words will at once explain all i feel about old age marcus cato publius cornelius scipio africanus the younger gaius laelius two scipio many a time have i in conversation with my friend gaius laelius here expressed my admiration marcus cato of the eminent nay perfect wisdom displayed by you indeed at all points but above everything because i have noticed that old age never seemed a burden to you while to most old men it is so hateful that they declare themselves under a weight heavier than etna cato your admiration is easily excited it seems my dear scipio and laelius men of course who have no resources in themselves for securing a good and happy life find every age burdensome but those who look for all happiness from within can never think anything bad which nature makes inevitable in that category before anything else comes old age to which all wish to attain and at which all grumble when attained such is folly's inconsistency and unreasonableness they say that it is stealing upon them faster than they expected in the first place who compelled them to hug an illusion for in what respect did old age steal upon manhood faster than manhood upon childhood in the next place in what way would old age have been less disagreeable to them if they were in their eight hundredth year than in their eightieth for their past however long when once it was past would have no consolation for a stupid old age wherefore if it is your wont to admire my wisdom and i would that it were worthy of your good opinion and of my own surname of sapiens it really consists in the fact that i follow nature the best of guides as i would a god and am loyal to her commands 
it is not likely if she has written the rest of the play well that she has been careless about the last act like some idle poet but after all some last was inevitable just as to the berries of a tree and the fruits of the earth there comes in the fullness of time a period of decay and fall a wise man will not make a grievance of this to rebel against nature is not that to fight like the giants with the gods Lelius and yet cato you will do us a very great favour i venture to speak for scipio as for myself if since we all hope or at least wish to become old men you would allow us to learn from you in good time before it arrives by what methods we may most easily acquire the strength to support the burden of advancing age cato i will do so without doubt Lelius, especially if as you say it will be agreeable to you both Lelius, we do wish very much cato if it is no trouble to you to be allowed to see the nature of the bourne which you have reached after completing a long journey as it were upon which we too are bound to embark three cato i will do the best i can Lelius. it has often been my fortune to bear the complaints of my contemporaries like will to like you know according to the old proverb complaints to which men like c salinator and s p albinus who were of consular rank and about my time used to give vent they were first that they had lost the pleasures of the senses without which they did not regard life as life at all and secondly that they were neglected by those from whom they had been used to receive attentions such men appear to me to lay the blame on the wrong thing for if it had been the fault of old age then these same misfortunes would have befallen me and all other men of advanced years but i have known many of them who never said a word of complaint against old age for they were only too glad to be freed from the bondage of passion and were not at all looked down upon by their friends the fact is that the blame for all complaints of that kind is to be charged to character not to a particular time of life for old men who are reasonable and neither cross-grained nor churlish find old age tolerable enough whereas unreason and churlishness cause uneasiness at every time of life Lelius, it is as you say cato but perhaps some one may suggest that it is your large means wealth and high position that make you think old age tolerable whereas such good fortune only falls to few cato there is something in that Lelius, but by no means all for instance the story is told of the answer of themistocles in a wrangle with a certain seraphian who asserted that he owed his brilliant position to the reputation of his country not to his own if i had been a seraphian said he even i should never have been famous nor would you if you had been an athenian something like this may be said of old age for the philosopher himself could not find old age easy to bear in the depth of poverty nor the fool feel it anything but a burden though he were a millionaire you may be sure my dear scipio and Lelius, that the arms best adapted to old age are culture and the active exercise of the virtues for if they have been maintained at every period if one has lived much as well as long the harvest they produce is wonderful not only because they never fail us even in our last days though that in itself is supremely important but also because the consciousness of a well-spent life and the recollection of many virtuous actions are exceedingly delightful for take the case of quintus fabius maximus the man i mean who recovered tarentum when i was a young man and he an old one i was as much attached to him as if he had been my contemporary for that great man serious dignity was tempered by courteous manners nor did old age make any change in his character true he was not exactly an old man when my devotion to him began yet he was nevertheless well on in life for his first consulship fell in the year after my birth when quite a stripling i went with him in his fourth consulship as a soldier in the ranks on the expedition against capua and in the fifth year after that against tarentum four years after that i was elected quaestor holding office in the consulship of tuditanus and theseus 
in which year indeed he as a very old man spoke in favour of the cincian law on gifts and fees now this man conducted wars with all the spirit of youth when he was far advanced in life and by his persistence gradually wearied out hannibal when rioting in all the confidence of youth how brilliant are those lines of my friend ennius on him for us down beaten by the storms of fate one man by wise delays restored the state praise or dispraise moved not his constant mood true to his purpose to his country's good down ever-lengthening avenues of fame thus shines and shall shine still his glorious name again what vigilance what profound skill did he show in the capture of tarentum it was indeed in my hearing that he made the famous retort to salinator who had retreated into the citadel after losing the town it was owing to me quintus fabius that you retook tarentum quite so he replied with a laugh for had you not lost it i should never have recovered it nor was he less eminent in civil life than in war in his second consulship though his colleague would not move in the matter he resisted as long as he could the proposal of the tribune c flamininus to divide the territory of the Pisinians and gauls in free allotments in defiance of a resolution of the senate again though he was an augur he ventured to say that whatever was done in the interests of the state was done with the best possible auspices that any laws proposed against its interest were proposed against the auspices i was cognizant of much that was admirable in that great man but nothing struck me with greater astonishment than the way in which he bore the death of his son a man of brilliant character and who had been consul his funeral speech over him is in wide circulation and when we read it is there any philosopher of whom we do not think meanly nor in truth was he only great in the light of day and in the sight of his fellow-citizens he was still more eminent in private and at home what a wealth of conversation what weighty maxims what a wide acquaintance with ancient history what an accurate knowledge of the science of augury for a roman too he had a great tincture of letters he had a tenacious memory for military history of every sort whether of roman or foreign wars and i used at that time to enjoy his conversation with a passionate eagerness as though i already divined what actually turned out to be the case that when he died there would be no one to teach me anything five what then is the purpose of such a long disquisition on maximus it is because you now see that an old age like his cannot conscientiously be called unhappy yet it is after all true that everybody cannot be a scipio or a maximus with stormings of cities with battles by land and sea with wars in which they themselves commanded and with triumphs to recall besides this there is a quiet pure and cultivated life which produces a calm and gentle old age such as we have been told plato's was who died at his writing-desk in his eighty-first year or like that of isocrates who says that he wrote the book called the panegyric in his ninety-fourth year and who lived for five years afterwards while his master gorgias of leontini completed a hundred and seven years without ever relaxing his diligence or giving up work when someone asked him why he consented to remain so long alive i have no fault said he to find with old age that was a noble answer and worthy of a scholar for fools impute their own frailties and guilt to old age contrary to the practice of ennui whom i mentioned just now in the lines like some brave steed that oft before the olympic wreath of victory bore now by the weight of years oppressed forgets the race and takes his rest he compares his own old age to that of a high-spirited and successful racehorse and him indeed you may very well remember for the present consuls titus flamininus and manius asilis were elected in the nineteenth year after his death 
and his death occurred in the consulship of capio and philippus the latter consul for the second time in which year i then sixty-six years old spoke in favour of the volconian law in a voice that was still strong and with lungs still sound while he though seventy years old supported two burdens considered the heaviest of all poverty and old age in such a way as to be all but fond of them the fact is that when i come to think it over i find that there are four reasons for old age being thought unhappy first that it withdraws us from active employments second that it enfeebles the body third that it deprives us of nearly all physical pleasures fourth that it is the next step to death of each of these reasons if you will allow me let us examine the force and justice separately six old age withdraws us from active employments from which of them do you mean from those carried on by youth and bodily strength are there not then no old men's employments to be after all conducted by the intellect even when bodies are weak so then quintus maximus did nothing nor el aminius our father scipio and my excellent son's father-in-law so with other old men the fabricii the guru and coruscanii when they were supporting the state by their advice and influence they were doing nothing to old age appius claudius had the additional disadvantage of being blind yet it was he who when the senate was inclining towards a peace with pyrrhus and was for making a treaty did not hesitate to say what ennius has embalmed in the verses whither have swerved the soul so firm of yore is sense grown senseless can feet stand no more and so on in a tone of the most passionate vehemence you know the poem and the speech of appius himself is extant now he delivered it seventeen years after his second consulship there having been an interval of ten years between the two consulships and he having been censor before his previous consulship this will show you that at the time of the war with pyrrhus he was a very old man yet this is the story handed down to us there is therefore nothing in the arguments of those who say that old age takes no part in public business they are like men who would say that a steersman does nothing in sailing a ship because while some of the crew are climbing the masts others hurrying up and down the gangways others pumping out the bilge water he sits quietly in the stern holding the tiller he does not do what young men do nevertheless he does what is much more important and better the great affairs of life are not performed by physical strength or activity or nimbleness of body but by deliberation character expression of opinion of these old age is not only not deprived but as a rule has them in greater degree unless by any chance i who as a soldier in the ranks as military tribune as legate and as consul have been employed in various kinds of war now appear to you to be idle because not actively engaged in war but i enjoin upon the senate what is to be done and how carthage has long been harboring evil designs and i accordingly proclaim war against her in good time i shall never cease to entertain fears about her till i hear of her having been levelled with the ground the glory of doing that i pray that the immortal gods may reserve for you scipio so that you may complete the task begun by your grandfather now dead more than thirty-two years ago though all years to come will keep that great man's memory green he died in the year before my censorship nine years after my consulship having been returned to consul for the second time in my own consulship if then he had lived to his hundredth year would he have regretted having lived to be old for he would of course not have been practising rapid marches nor dashing on a foe nor hurling spears from a distance nor using swords at close quarters but only counsel reason and senatorial eloquence and if those qualities had not resided in us seniors our ancestors would never have called their supreme council a senate at sparta indeed those who hold the highest magistracies are in accordance with the fact actually called elders 
but if you will take the trouble to read or listen to foreign history you will find that the mightiest states have been brought into peril by young men have been supported and restored by old the question occurs in the poet navius's sport pray who are those who brought your state with such dispatch to meet its fate there is a long answer but this is the chief point a crop of brand-new orators we grew and foolish paltry lads who thought they knew for of course rashness is the note of youth prudence of old age seven but it is said memory dwindles no doubt unless you keep it in practice or if you happen to be somewhat dull by nature themistocles had the names of all his fellow-citizens by heart do you imagine that in his old age he used to address aristides as lysimachus for my part i know not only the present generation but their fathers also and their grandfathers nor have i any fear of losing my memory by reading tombstones according to the vulgar superstition on the contrary by reading them i renew my memory of those who are dead and gone nor in point of fact have i ever heard of any old man forgetting where he had hidden his money they remember everything that interests them when to answer to their bail business appointments who owes them money and to whom they owe it what about lawyers pontiffs augurs philosophers when old what a multitude of things they remember old men retain their intellects well enough if only they keep their minds active and fully employed nor is that the case only with men of high position and great office it applies equally to private life and peaceful pursuits sophocles composed tragedies to extreme old age and being relieved to neglect the care of his property owing to his devotion to his art his sons brought him into court to get a judicial decision depriving him of the management of his property on the ground of weak intellect just as in our law it is customary to deprive a pater familias of the management of his property if he is squandering it thereupon the old poet is said to have read to the judges the play he had on hand and had just composed the oedipus colonius and to have asked them whether they thought that the work of a man of weak intellect after the reading he was acquitted by the jury did old age then compel this man to become silent in his particular art or homer hesiod simonides or isocrates and gorgias whom i mentioned before or the founders of schools of philosophy pythagoras democritus plato xenocrates or leto zeno and cleanthus or diogenes the stoic whom you too saw at rome is it not rather the case with all these that the active pursuit of study only ended with life but to pass over these sublime studies i can name some rustic romans from the sabine district neighbours and friends of my own without whose presence farm work of importance is scarcely ever performed whether sowing or harvesting or storing crops and yet in other things this is less surprising for no one is so old as to think he may not live a year but they bestow their labour on what they know does not affect them in any case he plants his trees to serve a race to come as our poet stasius says in his comrades nor indeed would a farmer however old hesitate to answer any one who asked him for whom he was planting for the immortal gods whose will it was that i should not merely receive these things from my ancestors but should also hand them on to the next generation eight that remark about the old man is better than the following if age brought nothing worse than this it were enough to mar our bliss that he who buys for many years sees much to shun and much for tears yes and perhaps much that gives him pleasure too besides as to subjects for tears he often comes upon them in youth as well a still more questionable sentiment in the name cecilius is no greater misery can of old age be told than this be sure the young dislike the old delight in them is nearer the mark than dislike for just as old men if they are wise take pleasure in the society of young men of good parts and as old age is rendered less dreary for those who are courted and liked by the youth 
so also do young men find pleasure in the maxims of the old by which they are drawn to the pursuit of excellence nor do i perceive that you find my society less pleasant than i do yours but this is enough to show you how so far from being listless and sluggish old age is even a busy time always doing and attempting something of course of the same nature as each man's taste had been in the previous part of his life nay do not some even add to their stock of learning we see solon for instance boasting in his poems that he grows old daily learning something new or again in my own case it was only when an old man that i became acquainted with greek literature which in fact i absorbed with such avidity in my yearning to quench as it were a long-continued thirst that i became acquainted with the very facts which you see me now using as precedents when i heard what socrates had done about the lyre i should have liked for my part to have done that too for the ancients used to learn the lyre but at any rate i work hard at literature nine nor again do i now miss the bodily strength of a young man for that was the second point as to the disadvantages of old age any more than as a young man i miss the strength of a bull or an elephant you should use what you have and whatever you may chance to be doing do it with all your might what would be weaker than milo of croton's exclamation when in his old age he was watching some athletes practising in the course he is said to have looked at his arms and to have exclaimed with tears in his eyes ah well these are now as good as dead not a bit more so than yourself you trifler for at no time were you made famous by your real self but by chest and biceps sextus aelius never gave vent to such a remark nor many years after him titus coruncanius nor more recently p crosses all of them learned juris consults in active practice whose knowledge of their procession was maintained to their last breath i am afraid an orator does lose vigour by old age for his art is not a matter of the intellect alone but of lungs and body strength though as a rule that musical ring in the voice even gains in brilliance in a certain way as one grows old certainly i have not lost it and you see my years yet after all the style of speech suitable to an old man is the quiet and unemotional and it often happens that the chastened and calm delivery of an old man eloquent secures a hearing if you cannot attain to that yourself you might still instruct a scipio and a lelius for what is more charming than old age surrounded by the enthusiasm of youth shall we not allow old age even the strength to teach the young to train and equip them for all the duties of life and what can be a nobler employment for my part i used to think publius and Gnaeus scipio and your two grandfathers laelius aemilius and p africanus fortunate men when i saw them with a company of young nobles about them nor should we think any teachers of the fine arts otherwise than happy however much their bodily forces may have decayed and failed and yet that same failure of the bodily forces is more often brought about by the vices of youth than of old age for a dissolute and intemperate youth hands down the body to old age in a worn-out state xenophon cyrus for instance in his discourse delivered on his deathbed and at a very advanced age says that he never perceived his old age to have become weaker than his youth had been i remember as a boy lucius metellus who having been created pontifex maximus four years after his second consulship held that office twenty-two years enjoying such excellent strength of body in the very last hours of his life as not to miss his youth i need not speak of myself though that indeed is an old man's way and is generally allowed to my time of life don't you see in homer how frequently nestor talks of his own good qualities for he was living through a third generation nor had he any reason to fear that upon saying what was true about himself he should appear either over vain or talkative for as homer says from his lips flowed discourse sweeter than honey for which sweet breath he wanted no bodily strength 
and yet after all the famous leader of the greeks nowhere wishes to have ten men like ajax but like nestor if he could get them he feels no doubt of troy shortly falling ten but to return to my own case i am in my eighty-fourth year i could wish that i had been able to make the same boast as cyrus but after all i can say this i am not indeed as vigorous as i was as a private soldier in the punic war or as caistor in the same war or as consul in spain and four years later when as a military tribune i took part in the engagement at thermopylae under the consulship manius asilis gabrio but yet as you see old age has not entirely destroyed my muscles has not quite brought me to the ground the senate house does not find all my vigour gone nor the rostra nor my friends nor my clients nor my foreign guests for i have never given in to that ancient and much praised proverb old when young is old for long for myself i had rather be an old man a somewhat shorter time than an old man before my time accordingly no one up to the present has wished to see me to whom i have been denied as engaged but it may be said i have less strength than either of you neither have you the strength of the centurion tercius pontius is he the more eminent man on that account let there be only a proper husbanding of strength and let each man proportion his efforts to his powers such an one will assuredly not be possessed with any great regret for his loss of strength at olympia milo is said to have stepped into the course carrying a live ox on his shoulders which then of the two would you prefer to have given to you bodily strength like that or intellectual strength like that of pythagoras in fine enjoy that blessing when you have it when it is gone don't wish it back unless we are to think that young men should wish their childhood back and those somewhat older their youth the course of life is fixed and nature admits of its being run but one way and only once and to each part of our life there is something specially seasonable so that the feebleness of children as well as the high spirit of youth the soberness of maturer years and the ripe wisdom of old age all have a certain natural advantage which should be secured in its proper season i think you are informed scipio what your grandfather's foreign friend massinissa does to this day though ninety years old when he has once begun a journey on foot he does not mount his horse at all when on horseback he never gets off his horse by no rain or cold can he be induced to cover his head his body is absolutely free from unhealthy humours and so he still performs all the duties and functions of a king active exercise therefore and temperance can preserve some part of one's former strength even in old age eleven bodily strength is wanting to old age but neither is bodily strength demanded from old men therefore both by law and custom men of my time of life are exempt from those duties which cannot be supported without bodily strength accordingly not only are we not forced to do what we cannot do we are not even obliged to do as much as we can but it will be said many old men are so feeble that they cannot perform any duty in life of any sort or kind that is not a weakness to be set down as peculiar to old age it is one shared by ill health how feeble was the son of piafricanus who adopted you what weak health he had or rather no health at all if that had not been the case we should have had in him a second brilliant light in the political horizon for he had added a wider cultivation to his father's greatness of spirit what wonder then that old men are eventually feeble when even young men cannot escape it my dear laelius and scipio we must stand up against old age and make up for its drawbacks by taking pains we must fight it as we should an illness we must look after our health use moderate exercise take just enough food and drink to recruit but not to overload our strength nor is it the body alone that must be supported but the intellect and soul much more for they are like lamps 
unless you feed them with oil they too go out from old age again the body is apt to get gross from exercise but the intellect becomes nimbler by exercising itself for what cecilius means by old dotards of the comic stage are the credulous the forgetful and the slipshod these are faults that do not attach to old age as such but to a sluggish spiritless and sleepy old age young men are more frequently wanton and dissolute than old men but yet as it is not all young men that are so but the bad set among them even so senile folly usually called imbecility applies to old men of unsound character not to all appius governed four sturdy sons five daughters that great establishment and all those clients though he was both old and blind for he kept his mind at full stretch like a sow and never gave in to old age by growing slack he maintained not merely an influence but an absolute command over his family his slaves feared him his sons were in awe of him all loved him in that family indeed ancestral custom and discipline were in full vigour the fact is that old age is respectable just as long as it asserts itself maintains its proper rights and is not enslaved to any one for as i admire a young man who has something of the old man in him so do i an old one who has something of a young man the man who aims at this may possibly become old in body in mind he never will i am now engaged in composing the seventh book of my origins i collect all the records of antiquity the speeches delivered in all the celebrated cases which i have defended i am at this particular time getting into shape for publication i am writing treatises on augural pontifical and civil law i am besides studying hard at greek and after the manner of the pythagoreans to keep my memory in working order i repeat in the evening whatever i have said heard or done in the course of each day these are the exercises of the intellect these the training grounds of the mind while i sweat and labor on these i don't much feel the loss of bodily strength i appear in court for my friends i frequently attend the senate and bring motions before it on my own responsibility prepared after deep and long reflection and these i support by my intellectual not my bodily forces and if i were not strong enough to do these things yet i should enjoy my sofa imagining the very operation which i now was unable to perform but what makes me capable of doing this is my past life for a man who is always living in the midst of these studies and labours does not perceive when old age creeps upon him thus by slow and imperceptible degrees life draws to its end there is no sudden breakage it just slowly goes out twelve the third charge against old age is that it lacks sensual pleasures what a splendid service does old age render if it takes from us the greatest blot of youth listen my dear young friends to a speech of archytas of tarentum among the greatest and most illustrious of men which was put into my hands when as a young man i was at tarentum with quintus maximus no more deadly curse than sensual pleasure has been inflicted on mankind by nature to gratify which our wanton appetites are roused beyond all prudence or restraint it is a fruitful source of treasons revolutions secret communications with the enemy in fact there is no crime no evil deed to which the appetite for sensual pleasures does not impel us fornications and adulteries and every abomination of that kind are brought about by the enticements of pleasure and by them alone intellect is the best gift of nature or god to this divine gift and endowment there is nothing so inimical as pleasure for when appetite is our master there is no place for self-control nor where pleasure reigns supreme can virtue hold its ground 
to see this more vividly imagine a man excited to the highest conceivable pitch of sensual pleasure it can be doubtful to no one that such a person so long as he is under the influence of such excitation of the senses will be unable to use to any purpose either intellect reason or thought therefore nothing can be so execrable and so fatal as pleasure since when more than ordinarily violent and lasting it darkens all the light of the soul these were the words addressed by archytas to the samnite caius pontius father of the man by whom the consuls of spurius posthumus and titus viterius were beaten in the battle of codium my friend nearchus of tarentum who had remained loyal to rome told me that he had heard them repeated by some old men and that plato the athenian was present who visited tarantum i find in the consulship of el camelius and appius claudius what is the point of all this it is to show you that if we were unable to scorn pleasure by the aid of reason and philosophy we ought to have been very grateful to old age for depriving us of all inclination for that which it was wrong to do for pleasure hinders thought is a foe to reason and so to speak blinds the eyes of the mind it is moreover entirely alien to virtue i was sorry to have to expel lucius brother of the gallant titus flamininus from the senate seven years after his consulship but i thought it imperative to affix a stigma on an act of gross sensuality for when he was in gaul as consul he had yielded to the entreaties of his paramour at a dinner-party to behead a man who happened to be in prison condemned on a capital charge when his brother titus was censor who preceded me he escaped but i and flaccus could not countenance an act of such criminal and abandoned lust especially as besides the personal dishonour it brought disgrace on the government thirteen i have often been told by men older than myself who said that they had heard it as boys from old men that gaius fabricius was in the habit of expressing astonishment at having heard when envoy at the headquarters of king pyrrhus from the thessalian nasinius that there was a man of athens who professed to be a philosopher and affirmed that everything we did was to be referred to pleasure when he told this to manius curius and publius decius they used to remark that they wished that the samnites and pyrrhus himself would hold the same opinion it would be much easier to conquer them if they had once given themselves over to sensual indulgences manius curius had been intimate with publius decius who four years before the former's consulship had devoted himself to death for the republic both fabricius and coruncanius knew him also and from the experience of their own lives as well as from the action of publius decius they were of opinion that there did exist among intrinsically noble and great which was sought for its own sake and at which all the best men aimed to the contempt and neglect of pleasure why then do i spend so many words on the subject of pleasure why because far from being a charge against old age that it does not much feel the want of any pleasures it is its highest praise but you will say it is deprived of the pleasures of the table the heaped-up board the rapid passing of the wine-cup well then it is also free from headache disordered digestion broken sleep but if we must grant pleasure something since we do not find it easy to resist its charms for plato with happy inspiration calls pleasure vice's bait because of course men are caught by it as fish by a hook yet although old age has to abstain from extravagant banquets it is still capable of enjoying modest festivities as a boy i often used to see gaius dullius the son of marcus then an old mele returning from a dinner-party he thoroughly enjoyed the frequent use of torch and flute-player distinctions which he had assumed though unprecedented in the case of a private person it was the privilege of his glory but why mention others i will come back to my own case to begin with i have always remained a member of a club clubs you know were established in my quaestorship on the reception of the magna mater from ida 
so i used to dine at their feast with the members of my club on the whole with moderation though there was a certain warmth of temperament natural to my time of life but as that advances there is a daily decrease of all excitement nor was i in fact ever wont to measure my enjoyment even of these banquets by the physical pleasures they gave more than by the gathering and conversation of friends for it was a good idea of our ancestors to style the presence of guests at a dinner-table seeing that it implied a community of enjoyment a convivium a living together it is a better term than the greek words which mean a drinking together or an eating together for they would seem to give the preference to what is really the least important part of it end of treatise two part one Treatise Two of On Friendship and On Old Age by Marcus Tullius Cicero. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Treatise Two On Old Age, Part Two. Fourteen. For myself, owing to the pleasure I take in conversation, I enjoy even banquets that begin early in the afternoon and not only in company with my contemporaries, of whom very few survive but also with men of your age and with yourselves i am thankful to old age which has increased my avidity for conversation while it has removed that for eating and drinking but if any one does enjoy these not to seem to have proclaimed war against all pleasure without exception which is perhaps a feeling inspired by nature i fail to perceive even in these very pleasures that old age is entirely without the power of appreciation for myself i take delight even in the old-fashioned appointment of master of the feast and in the arrangement of the conversation which according to ancestral custom is begun from the last place on the left-hand couch when the wine is brought in as also in the cups which as in xenophon's banquet are small and filled by driblets and in the contrivance for cooling in summer and for warming by the winter sun or winter fire these things i keep up even among my sabine countrymen and every day have a full dinner party of neighbours which we prolong as far into the night as we can with varied conversation but you may urge there is not the same tingling sensation of pleasure in old men no doubt but neither do they miss it so much for nothing gives you uneasiness which you do not miss that was a fine answer of sophocles to a man who asked him when in extreme old age whether he was still a lover heaven forbid he replied i was only too glad to escape from that as though from a boorish and insane master to men indeed who are keen after such things it may possibly appear disagreeable and uncomfortable to be without them but to jaded appetites it is pleasanter to lack than to enjoy however he cannot be said to lack who does not want my contention is that not to want is the pleasanter thing but even granting that youth enjoys these pleasures with more zest in the first place they are insignificant things to enjoy as i have said and in the second place such as age is not entirely without if it does not possess them in profusion just as a man gets greater pleasure from ambivious turpio if seated in the front row at the theatre than if he was in the last yet after all the man in the last row does get pleasure so youth because it looks at pleasures at closer quarters perhaps enjoys itself more yet even old age looking at them from a distance does enjoy itself well enough why what blessings are these that the soul having served its time so to speak in the campaigns of desire and ambition rivalry and hatred and all the passions should live in its own thoughts and as the expression goes should dwell apart indeed if it has in store any of what i may call the food of study and philosophy nothing can be pleasanter than an old age of leisure we were witnesses to see gallus a friend of your father's scipio intent to the day of his death on mapping out the sky and land how often did the light surprise him while still working out a problem begun during the night 
how often did night find him busy on what he had begun at dawn how he delighted in predicting for us solar and lunar eclipses long before they occurred or even in studies of a lighter nature though still requiring keenness of intellect what pleasure navius took in his punic war plautus in his truculentus and pseudolus i even saw livius andronicus who having produced a play six years before i was born in the consulship of cento and tudentus lived till i had become a young man why speak of publius licinius crassus devotion to pontifical and civil law or of the publius scipio of the present time who within these last few days has been created pontifex maximus and again i have seen all whom i have mentioned ardent in these pursuits when old men then there is marcus cethegus whom ennius justly called persuasion's marrow with what enthusiasm did we see him exert himself in oratory even when old what pleasures are there in feasts games or mistresses comparable to pleasures such as these and they are all tastes too connected with learning which in men of sense and good education grow with their growth it is indeed an honourable sentiment which solon expresses in a verse which i have quoted before that he grew old learning many a fresh lesson every day than that intellectual pleasure none certainly can be greater fifteen i come now to the pleasures of the farmer in which i take amazing delight these are not hindered by any extent of old age and seem to me to approach nearest to the ideal wise man's life for he has to deal with the earth which never refuses its obedience nor ever returns what it has received without usury sometimes indeed with less but generally with greater interest for my part however it is not merely the thing produced but the earth's own force and natural productiveness that delight me for received in its bosom the seed scattered broadcast upon it softened and broken up she first keeps it concealed therein hence the harrowing which accomplishes this gets its name from a word meaning to hide next when it has been warmed by her heat and close pressure she splits it open and draws from it the greenery of the blade this supported by the fibres of the root little by little grows up and held upright by its jointed stock is enclosed in sheaths as being still immature when it has emerged from them it produces an ear of corn arranged in order and is defended against the pecking of the smaller birds by a regular palisade of spikes need i mention the starting planting and growth of vines i can never have too much of this pleasure to let you into the secret of what gives my old age repose and amusement for i say nothing here of the natural force which all things propagated from the earth possess the earth which from that tiny grain in a fig or the grape-stone in a grape or the most minute seeds of the other cereals and plants produces such huge trunks and boughs mallet shoots slips cuttings quicksets layers are they not enough to fill any one with delight and astonishment the vine by nature is apt to fall and unless supported draws down to the earth yet in order to keep itself upright it embraces whatever it reaches with its tendrils as though they were hands then as it creeps on spreading itself in intricate and wild profusion the dresser's art prunes it with the knife and prevents it growing a forest of shoots and expanding to excess in every direction accordingly at the beginning of spring in the shoots which have been left there protrudes at each of the joints what is termed an blank from this the grape emerges and shows itself which swollen by the juice of the earth and the heat of the sun is at first very bitter to the taste but afterwards grows sweet as it matures and being covered with tendrils is never without a moderate warmth and yet is able to ward off the fiery heat of the sun can anything be richer in product or more beautiful to contemplate it is not its utility only as i said before that charms me but the method of its cultivation and the natural process of its growth 
the rows of uprights the cross pieces for the tops of the plants the tying up of the vines and their propagation by layers the pruning to which i have already referred of some shoots the setting of others i need hardly mention irrigation or trenching and digging the soil which much increase its fertility as to the advantage of manuring i have spoken in my book on agriculture the learned hesiod did not say a single word on this subject though he was writing on the cultivation of the soil yet homer who in my opinion was many generations earlier represents laertes as softening his regret for his son by cultivating and manuring his farm nor is it only in cornfields and meadows and vineyards and plantations that a farmer's life is made cheerful there are the garden and the orchard the feeding of sheep the swarms of bees endless varieties of flowers nor is it only planting out that charms there is also grafting surely the most ingenious invention ever made by husbandmen sixteen i might continue my list of the delights of country life but even what i have said i think is somewhat overlong however you must pardon me for farming is a very favourite hobby of mine and old age is naturally rather garrulous for i would not be thought to acquit it of all faults well it was in a life of this sort that manius curius after celebrating triumphs over the samnites the sabines and the pyrrhus spent his last days when i look at his villa for it is not far from my own i never can enough admire the man's own frugality or the spirit of the age as curius was sitting at his hearth the samnites who brought him a large sum of gold were repulsed by him for it was not he said a fine thing in his eyes to possess gold but to rule those who possessed it could such a high spirit fail to make old age pleasant but to return to farmers not to wander from my own metier in those days there were senators i e old men on their farms for l quintius cincinnatus was actually at the plough when word was brought him that he had been named dictator it was by his order as dictator by the way that c servilius ahala the master of the horse seized and put to death spurius malius when attempting to obtain royal power curius as well as other old men used to receive their summonses to attend the senate in their farmhouses from which circumstance the summoners were called viatores or travellers was these men's old age an object of pity who found their pleasure in the cultivation of the land in my opinion scarcely any life can be more blessed not alone from its utility for agriculture is beneficial to the whole human race but also as much from the mere pleasure of the thing to which i have already alluded and from the rich abundance and supply of all things necessary for the food of man and for the worship of the gods above so as these are objects of desire to certain people let us make our peace with pleasure for the good and hard-working farmer's wine cellar and oil store as well as his larder are always well filled and his whole farmhouse is richly furnished it abounds in pigs goats lambs fowls milk cheese and honey then there is the garden which the farmers themselves call their second flitch a zest and flavour is added to all these by hunting and fowling in spare hours need i mention the greenery of meadows the rows of trees the beauty of vineyard and olive grove i will put it briefly nothing can either furnish necessaries more richly or present a fairer spectacle than well-cultivated land and to the enjoyment of that old age does not merely present no hindrance it actually invites and allures to it for where else can it better warm itself either by basking in the sun or by sitting by the fire or at the proper time cool itself more wholesomely by the help of shade or water let the young keep their arms then to themselves their horses spears their foils and ball their swimming baths and running path to us old men let them out of the many forms of sport leave dice and counters but even that as they choose since old age can be quite happy without them seventeen xenophon's books are very useful for many purposes 
pray go on reading them with attention as you have ever done in what ample terms is agriculture lauded by him in the book about husbanding one's property which is called oconomicus but to show you that he thought nothing so worthy of a prince as the taste for cultivating the soil i will translate what socrates says to critobulus in that book when that most gallant laodaemonian lysander came to visit the persian prince cyrus at sardis so eminent for his character and the glory of his rule bringing him presents from his allies he treated lysander in all ways with courteous familiarity and kindness and among other things took him to see a certain park carefully planted lysander expressed admiration of the height of the trees and the exact arrangement of their rows in the kinkunx the careful cultivation of the soil its freedom from weeds and the sweetness of the odours exhaled from the flowers and went on to say that what he admired was not the industry only but also the skill of the man by whom this had been planted and laid out cyrus replied well it was i who planned the whole thing these rows are my doing the laying out is all mine many of the trees were even planted by my own hand then lysander looking at his purple robe the brilliance of his person and his adornment persian fashion with gold and many jewels said people are quite right cyrus to call you happy since the advantages of high fortune have been joined to an excellence like yours this kind of good fortune then it is in the power of old men to enjoy nor is age any bar to our maintaining pursuits of every other kind and especially of agriculture to the very extreme verge of old age for instance we have it on record that marcus valerius corvus kept it up to his hundredth year living on his land and cultivating it after his active career was over though between his first and sixth consulships there was an interval of six and forty years so that he had an official career lasting the number of years which our ancestors define as coming between birth and the beginning of old age moreover that last period of his old age was more blessed than that of his middle life inasmuch as he had greater influence and less labour for the crowning grace of old age is influence how great was that of l cecilius metellus how great that of attilius calactinus over whom the famous epitaph was placed very many classes agree in deeming this to have been the very first man of the nation the line cut on his tomb is well known it is natural then that a man should have had influence in whose praise the verdict of history is unanimous again in recent times what a great man was publius crassus pontifex maximus and his successor in the same office marcus lepidus i need scarcely mention paulus or africanus or as i did before maximus it was not only their senatorial utterances which had weight their least gesture had it also in fact old age especially when it has enjoyed honours has an influence worth all the pleasures of youth put together eighteen but throughout my discourse remember that my panegyric applies to an old age that has been established on foundations laid by youth from which may be deduced what i once said with universal applause that it was a wretched old age that had to defend itself by speech neither white hairs nor wrinkles can at once claim influence in themselves it is the honourable conduct of earlier days that is rewarded by possessing influence at the last even things generally regarded as trifling and matters of course being saluted being courted having way made for one people rising when one approaches being escorted to and from the forum being referred to for advice all these are marks of respect observed among us and in other states always most sedulously where the moral tone is highest they say that lysander the spartan whom i have mentioned before used to remark that sparta was the most dignified home for old age for that nowhere was more respect paid to years nowhere was old age held in higher honour 
nay the story is told of how when a man of advanced years came into the theatre at athens when the games were going on no place was given him anywhere in that large assembly by his own countrymen but when he came near the lacedaemonians who as ambassadors had a fixed place assigned to them they rose as one man out of respect for him and gave the veteran a seat when they were greeted with rounds of applause from the whole audience one of them remarked the athenians know what is right but will not do it there are many excellent rules in our augural college but among the best is one which affects our subject that precedence in speech goes by seniority and augurs who are older are preferred only to those who have held higher office but even to those who are actually in possession of imperium what then are the physical pleasures to be compared with the reward of influence those who have employed it with distinction appear to me to have played the drama of life to its end and not to have broken down in the last act like unpractised players but it will be said old men are fretful fidgety ill-tempered and disagreeable if you come to that they are also avaricious but these are faults of character not of the time of life and after all fretfulness and the other faults i mentioned admit of some excuse not indeed a complete one but one that may possibly pass muster they think themselves neglected looked down upon mocked besides with bodily weakness every rub is a source of pain yet all these faults are softened both by good character and good education illustrations of this may be found in real life as also on the stage in the case of the brothers in the adelphi what harshness in the one what gracious manners in the other the fact is that just as it is not every wine so it is not every life that turns sour from keeping serious gravity i approve of in old age but as in other things it must be within due limits bitterness i can in no case approve what the object of senile avarice may be i cannot conceive for can there be anything more absurd than to seek more journey money the less there remains of the journey nineteen there remains the fourth reason which more than anything else appears to torment men of my age and keep them in a flutter the nearness of death which it must be allowed cannot be far from an old man but what a poor dotard must he be who has not learnt in the course of so long a life that death is not a thing to be feared death that is either to be totally disregarded if it entirely extinguishes the soul or is even to be desired if it brings him where he is to exist for ever a third alternative at any rate cannot possibly be discovered why then should i be afraid if i am destined either not to be miserable after death or even to be happy after all who is such a fool as to feel certain however young he may be that he will be alive in the evening nay that time of life has many more chances of death than ours young men more easily contract diseases their illnesses are more serious their treatment has to be more severe accordingly only a few arrive at old age if that were not so life would be conducted better and more wisely for it is in old men that thought reason and prudence are to be found and if there had been no old men states would never have existed at all but i return to the subject of the eminence of death what sort of charge is this against old age when you see that it is shared by youth i had reason in the case of my excellent son as you had scipio in that of your brothers who were expected to attain the highest honours to realize that death is common to every time of life yes you will say but a young man expects to live long an old man cannot expect to do so well he is a fool to expect it for what can be more foolish than to regard the uncertain as certain the false as true an old man has nothing even to hope ah but it is just there that he is in a better position than a young man since what the latter only hopes he has obtained the one wishes to live long the other has lived long and yet good heaven what is long in a man's life for grant the utmost limit let us expect an age like that of the king of the tartessi 
for there was as i find recorded a certain agathonius at gades who reigned eighty years and lived a hundred and twenty but to my mind nothing seems even long in which there is any last for when that arrives then all the past has slipped away only that remains to which you have attained by virtue and righteous actions hours indeed and days and months and years depart nor does past time ever return nor can the future be known whatever time each is granted for life with that he is bound to be content an actor in order to earn approval is not bound to perform the play from beginning to end let him only satisfy the audience in whatever act he appears nor indeed a wise man go on to the concluding plaudite for a short term of life is long enough for living well and honourably but if you go farther you have no more right to grumble than farmers do because the charm of the spring season is past and the summer and autumn have come for the word spring in a way suggests youth and points to the harvest to be the other seasons are suited for the reaping and storing of the crops now the harvest of old age is as i have often said the memory and rich store of blessings laid up in easier life again all things that accord with nature are to be counted as good but what can be more in accordance with nature than for old men to die a thing indeed which also beliefs young men though nature revolts and fights against it accordingly the death of a young man seems to me like putting out a great fire with a deluge of water but old men die like a fire going out because it is burnt down of its own nature without artificial means again just as apples when unripe are torn from trees but when ripe and mellow drop down so it is violence that takes life from young men ripeness from old this ripeness is so delightful to me that as i approach nearer to death i seem as it were to be sighting land and to be coming to port at last after a long voyage twenty again there is no fixed border-line for old age and you are making a good and proper use of it as long as you can satisfy the call of duty and disregard death the result of this is that old age is even more confident and courageous than youth that is the meaning of solon's answer to the tyrant pisistratus when the latter asked him what he relied upon in opposing him with such boldness he is said to have replied on my old age but that end of life is the best when without the intellect or senses being impaired nature herself takes to pieces her own handiwork which she also put together just as the builder of a ship or a house can break them up more easily than any one else so the nature that knit together the human frame can also best unfasten it moreover a thing freshly glued together is always difficult to pull asunder if old this is easily done the result is that the short time of life left to them is not to be grasped at by old men with greedy eagerness or abandoned without cause pythagoras forbids us without an order from our commander that is god to desert life's fortress and outpost solon's epitaph indeed is that of a wise man in which he says that he does not wish his death to be unaccompanied by the sorrow and lamentations of his friends he wants i suppose to be beloved by them but i rather think ennius says better none grace me with their tears nor weeping loud makes sad my funeral rites he holds that a death is not a subject for mourning when it is followed by immortality again there may possibly be some sensation of dying and that only for a short time especially in the case of an old man after death indeed sensation is either what one would desire or it disappears altogether but to disregard death is a lesson which must be studied from our youth up for unless that is learnt no one can have a quiet mind for die we certainly must and that too without being certain whether it may not be this very day as death therefore is hanging over our head every hour how can a man ever be unshaken in soul if he fears it but on this theme i don't think i need much enlarge when i remember what lucius brutus did who was killed while defending his country 
or the two desiae who spurred their horses to a gallop and met a voluntary death or marcus atilius regulus who left his home to confront a death of torture rather than break the word which he had pledged to the enemy or the two scipios who determined to block the carthaginian advance even with their own bodies or your grandfather lucius paulus who paid with his life for the rashness of his colleague in the disgrace at cannae or marcus marcellus whose death not even the most bloodthirsty of enemies would allow to go without the honour of burial it is enough to recall that our legions as i have recorded in my origins have often marched with cheerful and lofty spirit to ground from which they believed they would never return that therefore which young men not only uninstructed but absolutely ignorant treat as of no account shall men who are neither young nor ignorant shrink from in terror as a general truth as it seems to me it is weariness of all pursuits that creates weariness of life there are certain pursuits adapted to childhood do young men miss them there are others suited to early manhood does that settled time of life called middle age ask for them there are others again suited to that age but not looked for in old age there are finally some which belong to old age therefore as the pursuits of the earlier ages have their time for disappearing so also have those of old age and when that takes place a satiety of life brings on the ripe time for death twenty one for i do not see why i should not venture to tell you my personal opinion as to death of which i seem to myself to have a clearer vision in proportion as i am nearer to it i believe scipio and laelius that your fathers those illustrious men and my dearest friends are still alive and that too with a life which alone deserves the name for as long as we are imprisoned in this framework of the body we perform a certain function and laborious work assigned us by fate the soul in fact is of heavenly origin forced down from its home in the highest and so to speak buried in earth a place quite opposed to its divine nature and its immortality but i suppose the immortal gods to have sown souls broadcast in human bodies that there might be some to survey the world and while contemplating the order of the heavenly bodies to imitate it in the unvarying regularity of their life nor is it only reason and arguments that have brought me to this belief but the great fame and authority of the most distinguished philosophers i used to be told that pythagoras and the pythagoreans almost natives of our country who in old times had been called the italian school of philosophers never doubted that we had souls drafted from the universal divine intelligence i used besides to have pointed out to me the discourse delivered by socrates on the last day of his life upon the immortality of the soul socrates who was pronounced by the oracle at delphi to be the wisest of men i need say no more i have convinced myself and i hold in view of the rapid movement of the soul its vivid memory of the past and its prophetic knowledge of the future its many accomplishments its vast range of knowledge its numerous discoveries that a nature embracing such varied gifts cannot itself be mortal and since the soul is always in motion and yet has no external source of motion for it is self-moved i conclude that it will also have no end to its motion because it is not likely ever to abandon itself again since the nature of the soul is not composite nor has in it any admixture that is not homogeneous and similar i conclude that it is indivisible and if indivisible that it cannot perish it is again a strong proof of men knowing most things before birth that when mere children they grasp innumerable facts with such speed as to show that they are not then taking them in for the first time but remembering and recalling them this is roughly plato's argument twenty two once more in xenophon we have the elder cyrus on his deathbed speaking as follows do not suppose my dearest sons that when i have left you i shall be nowhere and no one 
even when i was with you you did not see my soul but knew that it was in this body of mine from what i did believe then that it is still the same even though you see it not the honours paid to illustrious men had not continued to exist after their death had the souls of these very men not done something to make us retain our recollection of them beyond the ordinary time for myself i never could be persuaded that souls while in mortal bodies were alive and died directly they left them nor in fact that the soul only lost all intelligence when it left the unintelligent body i believe rather that when by being liberated from all corporeal admixture it has begun to be pure and undefiled it is then that it becomes wise and again when men's natural frame is resolved into its elements by death it is clearly seen whither each of the other elements departs for they all go to the place from which they came but the soul alone is invisible alike when present and when departing once more you see that nothing is so like death as sleep and yet it is in sleepers that souls most clearly reveal their divine nature for they foresee many events when they are allowed to escape and are left free this shows what they are likely to be when they have completely freed themselves from the fetters of the body wherefore if these things are so obey me as a god but if my soul is to perish with my body nevertheless do you from awe of the gods who guard and govern this fair universe preserve my memory by the loyalty and piety of your lives twenty three such are the words of the dying cyrus i will now with your good leave look at home no one my dear scipio shall ever persuade me that your father paulus and your two grandfathers paulus and africanus or the father of africanus or his uncle or many other illustrious men not necessary to mention would have attempted such lofty deeds as to be remaindered by posterity had they not seen in their minds that future ages concerned them do you suppose to take an old man's privilege of a little self-praise that i should have been likely to undertake such heavy labours by day and night at home and abroad if i had been destined to have the same limit to my glory as to my life had it not been much better to pass an age of ease and repose without any labour or exertion but my soul i know not how refusing to be kept down ever fixed its eyes upon future ages as though from a conviction that it would begin to live only when it had left the body but had it not been the case that souls were immortal it would not have been the souls of all the best men that made the greatest efforts after an immortality of fame again is there not the fact that the wisest man ever dies with the greatest cheerfulness the most unwise with the least don't you think that the soul which has the clearer and longer sight sees that it is starting for better things while the soul whose vision is dimmer does not see it for my part i am transported with a desire to see your fathers who were the object of my reverence and affection nor is it only those whom i knew that i longed to see it is those also of whom i have been told and have read whom i have myself recorded in my history when i am setting out for that there is certainly no one who will find it easy to draw me back or boil me up again like second peleus nay if some god should grant me to renew my childhood from my present age and once more to be crying in my cradle i would firmly refuse nor would i in truth be willing after having as it were run the full course to be recalled from the winning crease to the barriers for what blessing has life to offer should we not rather say what labour but granting that it has at any rate it has after all a limit either to enjoyment or to existence i don't wish to depreciate life as many men and good philosophers have often done nor do i regret having lived for i have done so in a way that lets me think that i was not born in vain but i quit life as i would an inn not as i would a home 
for nature has given us a place of entertainment not of residence o glorious day when i shall set out to join that heavenly conclave and company of souls and depart from the turmoil and impurities of this world for i shall not go to join only those whom i have before mentioned but also my son cato than whom no better man was ever born nor one more conspicuous for piety his body was burnt by me though mine ought on the contrary to have been burnt by him but his spirit not abandoning but ever looking back upon me has certainly gone whither he saw that i too must come i was thought to bear that loss heroically not that i really bore it without distress but i found my own consolation in the thought that the parting and separation between us was not to be for long it is by these means my dear scipio for you said that you and laelius were wont to express surprise on this point that my old age sits lightly on me and is not only not oppressive but even delightful but if i am wrong in thinking the human soul immortal i am glad to be wrong nor will i allow the mistake which gives me so much pleasure to be wrested from me as long as i live but if when dead as some insignificant philosophers think i am to be without sensation i am not afraid of dead philosophers deriding my errors again if we are not to be immortal it is nevertheless what a man must wish to have his life end at its proper time for nature puts a limit to living as to everything else now old age is as it were the playing out of the drama the full fatigue of which we should shun especially when we also feel that we have had more than enough of it this is all i had to say on old age i pray that you may arrive at it that you may put my words to a practical test end of treatise two part two end of on friendship and on old age by marcus tullius cicero translated by e s shuckburg